My name is Jordan Hargyle. I'm a master student here, as you all know. Um, I decided to present on rectenna use for gamma detection and spectroscopy. And uh, it was after I submitted my slides that I realized I failed to talk about why gammas are so awesome. So you get to look at my title slide while I tell you that. Uh, gamma radiation is extremely useful. Um, one thing that you can do with it, which is the focus of my research, is you can sanitize food and water with it while doing significantly less damage molecularly to the food than any other known treatment process, which means you get better nutrition, longer shelf life, um, basically everything better, better flavor, um, by treating it with gamma. You can also use it to measure cracks in airplane wings. Um, all materials crack under use, so you will never fly in an airplane that has less than several hundred thousand cracks in the wings. Nice, comfortable feeling for you. Um, but you can detect those using X-ray or gamma ray, because they get to be about the same magnitude as the cracks that you're looking for. Um, it can also be used to measure flow level in oil pipelines, um, determine impurities in crude oil without ever having to do any chemical analysis, just looking through the pipe. Um, you can use it to check fill lines in soda. Fun fact, every can of Coke or Coke product you've ever drunk has been irradiated with a gamma beam to figure out what its fill line is. Um, and then also every single nuclear reaction, including decay, results in gamma radiation as well. And these gammas are typically characteristic of the event, so you can then use it to identify materials, identify uh, reactions or events that have happened. Um, and it's actually extremely useful, although underdeveloped. So I'm gonna discuss two ways right now that we do gamma detection and analysis. Um, and then I'm going to discuss how antennas work, because if you're anything like me, you have no idea. Um, and then specifically how rectennas work, and then go into my experimental design analysis. So um, one common way of detecting radiation is with scintillators. A scintillator is basically a block of yellow material that when a particle of radiation enters, it excites the yellow atoms, which um, then when they fall down from their excited state, release a photon, typically at lower energy than the particle that came in. This lower energy gamma is then detected by a photocathode via the photoelectric effect, which then emits an electron, which propagates through a uh, photomultiplier tube, or PMT, in order to be detected on the other side. Um, they have a lot of advantages, but there are also some problems with them. Um, they boast a strong sensitivity. Um, they're tunable, so they actually have a broad spectral responsivity, depending on what material you're using for your photocathode. They can be tuned for anything between 120 uh, nanometers to 1200 nanometers, so that's 12.5 to 1.25 electron volts. Um, there's also a lot of different materials that you can use. They are, um, however, cumbersome. You have a vacuum on the backside. You need a high level of vacuum in order for the PMT to operate. They require high voltages to make those operate. They tend to be fairly large as far as detectors go um, and bulky. And because they're typically made of crystals, they're quite delicate. So if you drop one on the floor, it will probably cease to function. Um, another problem is <coughs> the data that you get out is kind of noisy because you're using an analog form of amplification, which can lead to difficulty reading spectral data. Another option that we have is semiconductor diodes. I will assume you all perfectly understand how semiconductors are built and operate. Um, so when you have radiation come in, you will create electron volt pairs as you knock some of those to the conduction band. And then those are pulled apart by a um, bias voltage that's applied. And then you have um, that little guy there is a reverse bias diode that then converts this whole process to a DC current, uh, which is then picked up by an amplifier and using regular circuitry. It then either counts it or if it's trying to discriminate based on the size of the pulse, um, it could try to determine some spectral information that way. Um, the good thing about these is they're uh, nice, simple devices. Um, they're relatively inexpensive and they're much more rugged than typical scintillators. And because you're already dealing on a semiconductor level, you tend to get much less noise 
when you amplify it because you just pass it directly into a preamp, which you can play with quite a bit. However, it's extremely difficult to balance response time with discrimination. So if you're looking for something that can quickly identify incoming radiation, you tend to not be able to spectrally identify it very well, and then the reverse is also true. Um, they're also very sensitive to uh, incoming radiation damage because they're relying on very small impurities. So um, there's yet a third option that has just started to really take off. Um, it's called a rectifying antenna. The basics of antenna operation is when you have an electromagnetic wave come by, the electrons inside of an antenna start to oscillate. That oscillation is then picked up as a um, AC current, I'm sorry, AC voltage, which you can then feed into circuitry and decode information on it, which is how all your radios work. Um, or you can do much more interesting things, which is typically done in radio astronomy and other somewhat more exotic fields. Um, another thing to note is that if you have the size of your antenna a half of the wavelength coming in, or even a quarter, depending on the way that you shape your antenna, um, the antenna will resonate uh, completely. And in that case, you get maximum power transfer. If you have anything other than a resonant frequency, you will get attenuation in the signal, because you'll actually have um, like waves on the beach. When another wave comes in, it'll interfere with the one leaving, and both of them will suffer you'll lose power from both of them. So that happens in antennas, and so you get this characteristic attenuation curve that is dependent on your specific tuning. Tuning is done um, from geometry, so if you just have wires, you'll increase or decrease the length, or you can have very exotic shapes, which I'll show you a bit later in this presentation. Um, you can also do it based on the impedance in your circuit. So a rectenna specifically, this is the Thevenin equivalent circuit for a rectenna. Um, the alternating current produced is your Thevenin source, and then your resistance is inherent resistance from the materials, and that's uh, capacitance and inductance is usually also inherent in the materials, so you can intentionally add some. And changing that in these three will affect your impedance, which affects your tuning. So you can have the same size antenna, but based on your tuning, you can actually get higher uh, energy resonance out of it, which is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, and then again, you have a reverse bias diode that converts all of this alternating to a single DC out. What this means is rectennas are actually capable of generating power when exposed to radiation, which is unique. Um, we do have, well, I lost my color there. Um, there are some physical limitations. This uh, handy chart will show you uh, different wavelengths. I can kind of see it over here. Um, but once you hit gamma, so once you get into the KEV, your wavelength's about one nanometer. And the typical wavelength, or the typical size of atoms um, is generally cited as half a nanometer. So once you get above one KEV, trying to tune it based on the size of your antenna becomes physically impossible because you can't build a one atom antenna as much as we would like to. So my study is broken into two phases. The first phase um, relies on this fact that uh, BMTs can be um, designed to detect anything from 115 nanometers to 1200. And a rectenna was operated this year at 540 where it generated power when exposed to a green laser. So phase one, uh, we're going to take a cesium iodide inorganic scintillator, which has a peak emission at exactly the wavelength they were using, coincidentally enough. Um, and then we're going to take two scintillators, one that has your PMT and the other one that will have a rectenna array. And we will expose them to two different kinds of radiation for two different tests. The first one is a 10 millicurie gamma source. Um, this is simply to check that it can consistently detect the photons that are emitted by cesium iodide um, over the course of several days. And then after that, it will be removed from service, verified that none of the circuitry or anything was damaged during that test. And then it will be exposed to americium-241, which is a nasty brute that spits out very high energy alpha particles. It is expected that these alpha particles will cause damage to the detectors. And so we'd be looking over the course of the three days to see how the damage affects the detection. 
Then the results of this will be compared to well, well uh, established and verified information for different simulators to see if it's even worth it to try to develop anything further. Uh, we suspect it will be based on papers and theoretical work around right tenants. So phase two would then uh, create multiple plates that have different zoned tunings. Um, and they all have similar tunings in each of the regions. Again, tunings can be done based on geometry. This is one of the more interesting geometries that I saw for micro antennas. Um, these are actually nano antennas designed to work in the petahertz range, um, which is about where we're looking for uh, that several hundred keV. Um, so what we do then is we would get a tungsten anode x-ray generator and use that to irradiate these um, rectenna sheets. The reason we're using tungsten is there's been some work done that can extremely accurately compute what the spectrum coming off a tungsten anode x-ray generator should look like. And since we can accurately compute it, that allows us to do a lot more analytics. Um, again, just to remind you, when you aren't perfectly tuned, you're going to get some attenuation, and you notice the attenuation moves around. It's not straight down. You actually get interesting forms. And so based on the tunings, we'll look to see if we have a good mix of characteristic spectra that we can then, um, with confidence, discriminate what level and what type of radiation has entered our detector. Although specifically for gamma, we want to be able to get a spectrometer. Um, and again, we'll be using computing methods to figure that out. And we suspect that there will be a combination of tunings that is most efficient to be able to discriminate. Um, we suspect it will be between four or five different tunings that can be mixed throughout the detector and that would give us a good spectrum. So in conclusion, uh, rectennas could provide a cheaper, more uh, lightweight option for detection that has several perks over current ones, including the ability to provide their own power under irradiation uh, for situations where you don't have the luxury of thousands of volts bias power. Um, they're flexible. You can grow these in thin sheets and wrap them around other things so they can be molded to any application that you need. Um, personal detectors or anything else. Um, it could be used to provide detailed spectroscopy, we assume, for UV to hard x-rays. So you're looking at anywhere from 3 EV uh, all the way up to about 400 keV. Um, and then this would provide other options for scintillators if we need more robust detectors than PMTs will allow. Again, we also expect the results to be cleaner through the amplification than PMTs. Um, these are my two pages of sources, and then do you have any questions? Questions? Looking at you, kid. Yes. I'll just double check. So you're also halfway proposing to replace the PMT with your antenna? That would be a application. And I assume it would be an easy one because it's already been proven that our antennas function well at the wavelengths that we see later skip us. You said that these can be grown in sheets and molded into different shapes for different applications. Yeah. Um, would the shaping of these sheets affect the efficiency of the rectennas? No. As long as you don't deform the rectenna itself or shadow other rectennas. Um, in which case, yeah, it might, depending on how you shape it. Um, but the way, the way that these are formed is you grow a forest of small carbon nanotubes, and then you plate both sides with different materials, which also can act as tuning because you'll have different quantum effects between different materials. And so you really have a lot of flexibility in how you customize these things, and then the sheets are very thin. And one of the applications proposed actually is to wrap um, waste heat lines out of power plants and harvesting the UV using micro rectennas. You could actually pull off about another end, uh, megawatt. Any more question? Okay, I do have a one. Yes. 
So um, it seems like uh, your this new type of detection is depends on the wavelength, the wavelengths of the income and the gamma ray or all other. Yes. So from design point of view, e for the detect detector. So is any possible to kind of a variable and the the, the 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 kind of a device to fitting on this half lambda property on it. That depends a lot on um, how to if that is possible then how to do about that. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of work on receiving antennas. Uh, RFIDs use both trans, well, they're bi-directional antennas actually. Um, but there's a lot of work for cell phones or smaller devices to have micro or nano antennas. And then you get these interesting shapes that give you very interesting uh, broadcast spectrum. And so, th I mean, in general, the field of antennas shows that you really have a lot of variability in how you design it, because you can use the exact same material but shape it differently. Or um, you can create nanoparticles and use those as antennas. Um, you can paint antennas. And so if I understand your question right, pretty much any type of customization you'd want to do is theoretically possible. It's just finding the right mix of materials and geometry would be um, perhaps tricky. Mm -hmm. Okay, a big hand again. <laughs> Thanks for everybody.